the uh, webinar. We've reached the top of the hour, so formally I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar, The Best Kept Secrets of WFM, Workforce Management. I'm delighted to be joined today by uh, two no, uh, well-known uh, speakers within the, uh, within the industry. Delighted to be joined by John Casey from uh, CC Planning. Uh, John is probably well known to a, a lot of people from his uh, many years at the uh, planning forum and now working as a, as a, as a consultant. And John, you've got a, an exciting assignment with uh, an insurance company uh, on, on the go. Yeah, I'm working with AXA at the moment. And I suppose the real beauty of it is it's, I'm actually living through the COVID and the, all the joys and interesting bits of working with no valid data and seeing how our staff is adapting. And that's probably some of the things we'll have a wee chat about in a few minutes time. Oh, there'll be some uh, great learning uh, lessons there. Also, uh, delighted to be uh, welcome back uh, to welcome back Mike Murphy, Murphy from uh, Genesis. Uh, Mike, it's great to uh, have you on again. Thank you, Jossie. Uh, good to meet you, John, and uh, hi, everybody. Uh, good to be back and looking forward to this webinar. I'm not normally invited to the uh, workforce management one, Jossie. I'm normally given the other. So <laughs> <laughs> here I am. I'm kind of uh, I'm curious. <laughs> well, wonderful. Well, there's some uh, great developments, uh, I think, that have been happening in Genesis of, uh, of late. So it'd be interesting to see the, uh, uh, some of the ways those are, those are coming through, which I think will be, uh, which will be great. So uh, just a reminder, if you're not already logged into our chat room, and um, I think we've only got about 44 of the 145 online uh, currently logged into our chat room. So for uh, the other 101 of you, um, it's just very easy to get into. We're carrying out the discussion there. Here's the address. It's uh, www.callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat. And uh, very easy, uh, if you just prefer a quick way of doing it, is just type in cch.chat into the browser on your mobile on your mobile phone. I'm afraid it's not uh, at this stage fully integrated. We are looking as we move to Zoom to see if we can integrate the chat room and the, the Zoom uh, session in the future, but that's uh, not for another month or so before we can uh, do that. Um, so yeah, just type in cch.chat and then have it either on your phone or on a side window and you can see the slides running alongside. A couple of bits, uh, advantages being in there uh, is you can download the webinar slides. Once you're in the chat room, you just follow this link at the top of the screen and you can uh, access mine, John and Mike's uh, presentations. Um, uh, there is a, uh, also we're giving for the best uh, WFM tip that happens today. If you want to use hashtag tip while you're in the uh, in the chat room, um, we do have a um, nice uh, bottle of champagne or if you prefer chocolates or if an Amazon gift voucher, we can certainly arrange that and we've, uh, or indeed if you prefer a charitable donation, we have been uh, uh, given a couple of uh, donations to Médecins Sans Frontiers we're doing a lot of uh, good work in uh, other countries with COVID right now. So it's your choice on uh, which uh, which gift or prize you'd like to uh, to if you uh, do the winning tip. Uh, so the the details again, cch.chat. I think now we've got 70 people uh, logged into the chat room. So I'd encourage everyone to uh, do that. We've also got these quiz buttons, and we'll be having a quiz after John's uh, presentation. See how much you uh, uh, have taken on. And uh, there's a couple of mystery questions in there as well, so a, a bit more fun. So uh, you'd have to vote with the ABC buttons. So I think uh, would uh, would tie in well. And if you want to watch a replay, uh, it will be available in about an hour's time. So uh, I'm going to do a short little overview to some of the things that I've seen uh, in terms of uh, workforce management, and particularly in scheduling. Uh, recently, which uh, I think I've seen, uh, I take a lot of questions off the forum, and so these are based on some of the questions that uh, come through. And one of the things I see is the what I'd call is the classic uh, scheduling problem, and that's that your uh, volumes don't fit in a sort of uh, a profile that is even across the day. They uh, jump up, build up in the morning, tend to have a, a morning peak, tend to have an afternoon peak. And you've got the, 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 the problem of trying to meet your shifts uh, against uh, all of that. So here's a few um, hints on how you can achieve that, uh, achieve that first. The interesting one that's pointed out to me a number of years ago uh, by Dave Appleby, who says that 
Uh, call arrivals tend to bunch up around the hour mark, and I suppose it's human nature that um, you know you've just uh, finished watching Coronation Street and you think, oh, I need to go off and uh, uh, and sort out a travel booking or something like that or a customer service, and so you tend to do or you. Going into a meeting and say, Oh, I just need to make this phone call before that I go into that meeting. So, what you tend to find is about 40% of the traffic tends to be grouped up in the first 15 minutes. There's about 30% in the, in the last 15 minutes of the hour, and actually only about 30% overall in this gap here. So, my first tip would be if you can move and you're not already moved across, move across to 15 minute reporting intervals. It gives you a lot more uh, granularity. There is a bit of a, a downside with doing that, and that's called uh, overhang. Um, and that's basically, if you have too short a, a reporting interval, um, a call, if it's too long, starts in one period and moves across into the other, and that can cause difficulties. It certainly causes things like Erlang calculations or even to some extent simulations to give erroneous answers. So the rule of thumb is that your average handling time should not be exceed 50% of the of the reporting period. So if you're going to a if you want to go to a 15 minute reporting period, your AHT should not be longer than 450 seconds, which is about seven and a half minutes. Uh, if you're going to a 30 minute reporting, it shouldn't be more than 900 seconds. So if you've got calls that are say half an hour long, really you're in a bit of an awkward situation there because one hour reporting would be good, but it's a bit difficult to to figure out how you deal with lunch breaks in that. So, uh, and one of the other things that, it, talking of lunch breaks, you can do once you're at 15 minute intervals is, and it's also human nature to say, oh, when does everyone want to have their lunch break? Oh, I'll go for 12 o'clock, I'll go for one, I'll go. Is actually, if you can, if you can move people to the 15 minute intervals. So, could you take lunch, please, at 12.15 or 12.45 or 1.15? What you're doing is you're starting to map some of the uh, some of the lunch times around that quieter period of the uh, of the hour. So just a little little trick there that uh, might work. Um, one of the things I like, and I, I probably need to get a set of Lego for where, when I do these presentations, um, but I think shifts are a bit like uh, Lego blocks. So you can have a, a sort of long one here, maybe that's eight hours long with uh, four pips on the top, and that might be a four-hour one. And you can almost build up the shift profile. If I sort of jump back here, you could almost build up this profile out of Lego blocks with a sort of shift uh, arrangement. And one of the problems a lot of people struggle with is this sort of rising, rising peak here. And you know, sort of people come in at eight o'clock, people come in at nine o'clock, and you get this sort of awkward bit where you're often sort of overstaffed for a bit, first bit of the hour, and maybe a bit understaffed here. And that's basically you know, a really simple technique, but I'm surprised that more people don't do it, which is basically to use staggered shifts, where you basically stagger shifts by every interval. I've done it here by, um, uh, by half hour. So you've got one at eight o'clock, you've got five people, then you bring seven people in at 8.30, seven in at nine o'clock, 9.30 as things build up. And you can very quickly get it quite a granular level here and you can certainly do that going up it's a bit more difficult to get it as it goes down and if volumes rise the big problem is you can get up to a certain point and then just get swamped swamped here so that's quite an interesting one another thing that a lot of people do is they uh, i see this in the, the uh, airline calculator results on the on the website is put in just one aht for the whole whole day so you might have a an aht and just plan that it's the stand standard average handling time. But if you actually plot this against time, and uh, Philip Stubbs from uh, Draco Consulting um, uh, shared with me this graph, I think it's just a great one. What you find is in the morning, uh, you typically find things like advisors are fresh, uh, callers phone in, they want to get their, their calls dealt with, they want to do it quickly, average handling times lower at the beginning of the day. As you get towards, say, things like the evening, uh, towards the end of the evening, advisors are getting tired, so they tend to talk longer. Uh, customers also get home from work, so perhaps they don't have the pressure on timing. They're happy to talk for uh, longer. And then all of a sudden, you get this sort of real uh, drop off at the end of a shift. And I, I've seen that. And again, it's human nature. You know, you're coming up towards the end of a shift, just get onto a phone call, and 
uh, oh, it's going to be a long one. So you sort of hurry the hurry the quarter off the phone. I mean, I've seen others where I've been waiting in queue, and it gets to 7:30, and all of a sudden you get answered, and the call drops, and then you phone back, and the call center is closed. So one of the, the the little techniques there is to take advisors off the phone before the end of the before the end of a shift. It start, stops all those bad behaviours. So here, someone's taking a phone call. The shift is due to uh, would have in the past have ended at eight, but if you end the shift at seven thirty, they take the first call, they take the second call. This call can then carry on until into this sort of buffer period, and then they can do admin and training for the last part of the last part of the shift. It stops calls getting cut, uh, cut off early, improves customer satisfaction. And one of the things I've seen and had a big discussion on LinkedIn about this one was just closing the uh, uh, closing the contact center thirty minutes on the website before it actually closes. So you say the contact center is open from uh, from 8 till 7.30 p.m. rather than 8 to 8. In actual fact, it's still running and up until later, but you actually just close it to incoming calls and just let that call volume die away. A great way, technique for increasing customer satisfaction uh, if you can, and uh, also sends a very strong signal to your advisors you also have the chance to do some admin and training, which is quite, quite important. And then the, just the last one that I still see people missing, uh, which is maximum occupancy. Uh, and uh, it's one of the things with the uh, contact centers, the bigger you get, the more calls you can chuck into people. And uh, Erlang will uh, naturally give you an answer. You can get really, really efficient when you've got large numbers of people and large volumes of calls. But if you keep on putting call after call after call through to everyone, uh, you can get uh, burnout. And um, I've had debates with people saying, no, no, we run much more higher than that, uh, higher levels of occupancy. You know, we're an outsource, we can take it 90, 95%. Well, you might be able to, but what you actually find is that that might be your occupancy, but what you've actually found is that you've got to, you've factored in that occupancy into the average handling time. And if you're running at say 95% occupancy, I can almost guarantee you, tired advisors take longer to answer calls because they're having to think about the answers they'd be able to quickly give. Their listening skills probably go down more as well, which increases it. Wrap time increases to uh, uh, to give advisors thinking time between actually speaking to the next person. And what also happens is you start getting advisors who use wrap time effectively to get a small uh, a small break as well. So. Um, if you want to, um, if you want to uh, 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 make things better, do not exceed 85% occupancy. So those are some of the tips that I've got that will potentially help you fit into some of the uh, some of the, the, the scheduling pieces uh, there, and I think work out well. And I know that John's also got quite a number of uh, a number of uh, secrets of uh, workforce management. So probably uh, quite a good time now to. Uh, Move across, and uh, John, if you'd like to um, just to change across to you, if you'd like to share some of your your thoughts on WFM. Across yes. to you, John. I think that's the screen up there now, John. Ty? It is indeed, yeah. It is. So, hi everyone, and it's great to be asked back to speak on this session again. It's a session I always enjoy, and a session I think it always gives us a bit of time to step back and think. And you'll see on the first slide that I've actually put a little subheading, which is where I think we all are in the workforce management world today. We're adapting to a dynamic world. I'm probably going to speak about COVID, although I don't like speaking about it as a COVID issue or what's happening. But I think it's something that's very real. I know many years ago when bird flu was around, I got called in to the NHS to help with some of the planning with that. And luckily at that point, a lot of our worst case scenarios never materialized. I think it has now, and it sort of shows that for some centers, we did these plans eight to 10 years ago, we've never used them, but yet some of us have got caught out with the severity when it did actually happen a few years later. But as I said, when John did the introductions, being able to be working in a live environment at the moment has really got the brain thinking and saying, how as planners we need to be vibrant and dynamic and always thinking about some of these things to to move forward 
So my details are up there. I'm not going to go through myself as we did the introductions, but if anybody does want to contact me afterwards, they can get my contact details up on the side deck. And carrying on from how I introduced, I do think that this is a time for planners to shine. We've got a really unique situation now where many of us have little to no valid data. We have a workforce who have been hired for a different environment to which they find themselves. Yeah. Uh, and we have a lot of demands of trying to meet service in a world where we know we probably may not meet service just because of everything going on. So it's a chance for our time for planners to use those magical crystal balls that operations and everybody else think we have to see into the future and to move forward and, and to shine. And to do that, I'm going to go back to what I think has always been the resource planning mantra. It's our job to have the right people in the right place at the right time. And that goes through all the elements of planning from real time to forecasting to scheduling. And I think that's probably where we should step back today and just look at the processes in all our centres, especially when everything changes and everything changes daily. Uh, I know in my work and my discussions with the guys here in AXA and all, we've had the quietest and the busiest days on record within 10 days of each other. Mm -hmm. So it's not it's got quiet or it's not it's got busy, it's got erratic. And that's probably the hardest thing for us to adapt to is that change, change, change. And every time we think we crack it, we have to move on to the next step. So maybe start with the core to everything, the right people. Lots of research over the years, 80 to 85 percent of our customer contact operations as people. So obviously getting the right people and using the people right is absolutely what we need to do. And the one thing that I've really lived the pain of and the pain of understanding is shrinkage definitions. Hmm. Since I guess for us in Ireland, St. Patrick's Day, when the Prime Minister or Taoiseach made an announcement whilst he was in Washington suggesting that lockdown was coming and people should consider isolation. I've seen that with the same people, you don't necessarily get the same number of folk online. On another webinar this morning that was on some of their topics, one guy mentioned that their sickness has gone through the floor. I know of operations where sickness has gone through the roof. There's no one way of other, but even where sickness was low, his warning was, is there hidden sickness? Is there stuff out there where people wouldn't have commuted, but they're coming because they want a distraction during the day? And is that going to build up to something down the line? You know, and it's something we probably have to be aware of. But some of the things I've seen is obviously holidays. Nobody wanted them in the first couple of weeks. And then people went, oh, I need a break from this, sitting in a back bedroom, sitting wherever I happen to be. And they do want holidays, which is great if that's happening because we don't build up a backlog. We're not going to get to November, December and realize we need to get 50% annual leave or we're carrying the cost into the next mm -hmm. year. Uh, but obviously sickness, uh, there were things like self-isolation and God forbid there'll be some of us having staff who do contract the virus that's out there and we'll have to take time off or family members will. But also emergency leave for things like homeschooling and children around and stuff like that. All we had, but there, we have to track them as pre-COVID and post-COVID or during COVID because they're here for now and they won't go away. They will go away if we ever get back to a semi-normal environment. We'll see when that comes. But we've also got things like technology, we've also got social circumstances. Are you in a in a house where you can work from home or not? Do you have broadband that's fast enough or not? And then we probably do need to be thinking, uh, and on a survey again this morning that I heard, you know, a lot of centres are looking at extra one-to-ones, extra team meetings, doing the stuff that happens through social interaction. The problem is our hired number probably hasn't changed. We might not have much attrition, but our number is pretty static. But our shrinkage is potentially going up and going up for the right reasons. So it leads to a challenge as the light coming in. And just again, going over some of the things I have, the excuses I've been hearing. Uh, 
with people were able to provide a computer and then they realized their kids needed a computer. We've had people dropping and breaking phones. Uh, in fact, we've had a site director in Tesco this morning buying mobile phones and delivering them to houses to get people back online. Stuff in February we would have laughed at and now it's a real life. So I think the key in that is on shrinkage, we do need to step back and we need to recalibrate and then look at the step changes if we have return to work plans on what shrinkage may go away and what shrinkage might stay and what can we deliver. I'm just going to quickly move on to forecasting because that's obviously part of having the right people knowing what we need. But Jonty's just going to throw a little poll up on the screen and maybe just get some feedback on where is everybody's volumes today. If we think yeah, of we're February. A poll just before I do that, just a reminder that if you're not already logged into the chat room, we've only got 86 of the 192 people online today in the chat room. So if you're not logged into the chat room, uh, and we will be doing a quiz in a short while, please could you go to callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat. Uh, we're not doing the, the poll in the chat room, but uh, that's the link. Uh, cch.chat is the way to do it if you just want to write that down. But in the meantime, uh, just want to know what's happening to your uh, contact uh, volumes. Uh, is it, uh, have they uh, increased much higher? Are they somewhat higher? Are they roughly the same? Are they somewhat lower or are they much lower? So how is the, what's happening to your uh, volumes compared to, uh, compared to your original forecast some time ago? Um, higher, the same or lower? So just like to, uh, uh, have a look at that. John, any thoughts on um, where you think this might end up? I think it could be everywhere, John, because at different points in the last seven weeks, I've been in all five categories. <laughs> well, let's have a look. And I think you, you're probably quite wise on that. 16% uh, much higher, 25% somewhat higher, 14% the same, 29% somewhat lower, and 16% much lower. So I think there's a, a quite a spread there. Um, it reminds me of the old uh, phrase, if it's a forecast, it's wrong. Um, yes. And uh, I think that, that probably gives you a, gives an idea that, that, that you know, there's quite a, quite a range on that. It is. I think you're 41% higher and 45% lower. So actually, statistically, that's essentially the same in that we're all getting our unique circumstances and what our customers need us for is driving it. Uh, and as I say, I've led through all of them. I'm just going to bring up actually something to show where it's been with blue being last year, green being this year, and we were fairly close, maybe a little bit around bank holidays or what date Easter fell, that kind of stuff, although this is a bit earlier. And then COVID hit, bang, and then suddenly the customers have migrated back into needing services. And I'm sure we all have lines like that. Whether John, the we're, is not, we're not seeing those uh, slides currently. If I just take back to myself it's and uh, change sorry, it to you, then uh, hopefully we get that transition across. Yes, sorry, too many screens. I, did, I didn't see the pop up. So as I said, blue for last year, green this year, patterns were fairly similar. Most of us would have lived with that, and then bang. Government announcements, COVID lockdowns, customers not able to do stuff, it changed. And we've all got that. And when I say about being dynamic, I think that's exactly where we're at at the moment. The only thing I find fascinating is when the customers call. And if I look at last year, February, January this year, the blue bar shows pretty typical call patterns this contact center was seeing. And the green is now. And when we think about it, staff who might be furloughed from their own organization aren't getting up as early in the morning. They're homeschooling kids. And then they're making their phone calls and then around lunchtime and stuff like that, and enjoying the evenings with their family. It's logical. We can see it. But going back to your slides, John, to you about shifts and where you put shifts, we hired to the blue lines. And we can't hire and we can't change people's working conditions. So we all have this of going out and speaking and we're going through quiet times, busy times across the day and it's a different challenge altogether. Now obviously, now you could be saying, yes, you're in training tomorrow at 8 a.m. 
we're having a team meeting at 8 a.m., 9 a.m. in the morning, changes the status quo in terms of where we go. So very something we do have to think about. And I think just to go through some stuff, there's some questions. I always ask the green box, which is, why do customers call you? And I think it's a question we have to ask all the time now. And in many cases, the only forecast we've got we can rely on is last week at the moment. But I think if we're going to do and move forward, we have to listen to the news, watch the news, see our government announcements wherever we are in the world, and then model, model, model. Would that drive me to want to contact my business, or more or less likely, and build it into our models? And probably to do that, I'm now advocating, giving two or three forecasts, what would we have been if COVID hadn't hit, and what's our best and worst estimates? I'd start talking to the business saying, hey, you might have thought we were wrong in the past. Now we're going with less data we can trust, but our best estimates is it's going to be between this upper and lower range. And I think it's a great principle without COVID. I think it's a better principle now when we go into any period of change is to give the best in the worst case scenarios. And John, on, on that, I mean, if you're giving a, a range of different forecasts, you know, quite often people go, no, just give me the forecast. Um, how, how do you get the, particularly the leadership team to go, well, it might be this, it might be that. And then you've got to kind of start for, what well, we might need, you know, 150 people, we might need 170. Uh, how do we get along the thing? Well, oh, in that case, you can have the lower number. Uh, how, how do you convince senior management uh, of that. Well, for me, a lot of it is doggedness, and I've tried this in many organisations as I keep going back with ranges. And sometimes you see a flip where it clicks with people, that they actually see that we're always within the top and the bottom, so they accept the variability and mm. keep going. If they want a number, then you've got to say it's the middle, and then, but the risk is if we hit the top, you're going to have a 10, 15, 20% in service level. If we hit the bottom, it's going to be in the 90s, 95s, 99s, but you're going to pay for staff we don't need. And give them a couple of things, but say, this is the reality. And I always find it's easier to ask people on a sunny day, hey, go home early, than it is the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to get people in, especially on a sunny day. Uh, and picking up on an article from yourself, there's lots of ways of doing forecasting from the straight naive forecasting of just saying last week, last month, this day, last year is the best indication through Holt Winters, regression analysis, artificial intelligence, do multiples and see which works. And I know I think, Mike, you might talk a little bit about some of the automation and stuff later. The key thing here is they all really end that data. I think a lot of us are saying we can't use the data. And a lot of our measurements is about taking averages and seeing how far away we were, were we 2% over 2% under? And I think it is key. Either side, over or under, is equally bad. We're either spending money on staff we don't need, or we haven't spent the money and we can't service customers who have come in. And there's one thing that I've got reading about lately, which is forecast value add. And it's probably just an addition to the process, which is very valuable at the moment. A lot of us may have done this, but it's start with the numbers. The methodology that gives the best fix is always the best methodology for you. But then talk, 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 talk to commercial, talk to marketing, talk to everyone who's out there and adjust based on those conversations and track those adjustments. Say, actually, every time I adjust because I spoke to so-and-so, it gets me closer. But when I speak to so-and-so, it takes me further away and start to build that into the process. We give numbers, but we can refine it as we go through. And if people Google, if you just have a look online on forecast value add, it's used a lot in re retail and where you have stock and stuff to understand customer behaviours. But it encourages you to speak to stakeholders who know what's happening and look beyond the numbers, learn from it and repeat. We'll quickly go on the right place because I'm conscious of time. Uh, and just the first slide is pre-COVID, we had a great environment. We all sat in our offices, we knew where we were, and now we're working to home working. And Jonty's just put up a little slide there. It'd be interesting to see what do people think? Are your staff more or less productive at the moment? 
So the question is, are your staff more or less productive in working from home? So uh, the votes are much more productive, somewhat more productive, about the same, somewhat less productive, or much less productive. And it's going to be absolutely fascinating to see what the uh, what the results are here. I don't know quite how we measure productivity, but I guess this is a, a bit of a, a, a gut feel. So let's have a look at the uh, let's have a look at the results here. Sample size of 194. Um, 10% say much, much more productive, or so much more productive. 32% somewhat more productive. 14% uh, about the same. 38% saying somewhat less productive and 6% uh, much less productive. So uh, results here that are really quite startling. And I, I suppose the um, this is a, as an average, you might find that some are more productive and some are less uh, less productive. Any surprises yeah. here, John? Probably not. 42 more productive, 44 below. So statistically, we're seeing both again. And actually, I think probably the slide I'm about to bring up, John, could probably explain some of that. And that I think we talk a lot about home working and we talk a lot about how great we have when we're able to get people to home. The survey this morning I just wrote down 70% of companies have gone to work from home. Probably the companies who don't are very blue light or emergency services and stuff like that. Uh, I think that's the screen back, is it? It is, yeah. It's indeed. Yeah. And the fact is we probably look at it and i'll come to one in a moment but at the moment we're not working from home we're working from where we can work during a pandemic which i think is very very different but i think from a planning perspective it opens up opportunities that some people split shifts works for them it gives them that opportunity to work start the end of the day and maybe they do the child care and switch over some people are willing to work longer shifts because they no longer have the commute, especially if you could give them maybe a half day every week during a quiet time. I'm seeing people sometimes do overtime easier because they'll do it during their commute time. So they start and finish from home at the same times. Uh, some people want different, but it, there is a ch chance, which is we can work with staff and that may lead to better productivity. But the slide I was referring to is I guess a lot of our managers think everybody's sitting on the left hand side at home with double screens etc perfect environment and the reality probably is there's a lot of our staff sitting on beds in corners or wherever they get a space that they can take a call or send an email and I think that leads to productivity is where people are and on I that John it was interesting I was on a, a, a webinar discussion yesterday where you know, one of the tips was to uh, turn on the turn on the cameras at team meetings. And yes. uh, how do you you overcome that reluctance of people to uh, to do it? I think you know a lot of people are a bit embarrassed by their sort of their working environment that we all think is you know everyone's got their own work from home den, but actually it's just you know often a corner of a bedroom, um, you know, and and can be quite challenging. Yeah, I, don't know, I, don't I, mean, know I think when we do, that, okay. sorry, Mike. Yeah, sorry, John. I, I don't have a bookcase, so I feel very sort of um, uh, like uh, without. I shouldn't come have a bookcase just to put in the background. <laughs> I feel very uneducated. <laughs> yes, and I think I know, John. You've mentioned going to Zoom soon, and I know when you go on Zoom, you can put fake backgrounds on, which I think does help people <laughs> because they don't have to show the mess, the ironing, the children's toys, or whatever might be behind them, because they can hide that out. But yes, I think it is a big thing that we are squeezed into whatever space we can commandeer in our house. And it's probably point two here. If we were doing homework, working, we would have hired them psychologically and profiled them. We would have assessed the working environment, done risk stuff, would have put in support, would have given them technology, would have put up the communications. For a lot of us, as we just said, here's a laptop login from home tomorrow. So for those who are seeing productivity dips, it's probably not a great surprise in terms of the speed at which we had to do it. As one company said to me, it took us three years to get 40 home and three days to get 400 home. <laughs> you know, which just shows yeah. that those results make a lot of sense because of that, of the two sides. So 
It doesn't surprise me at all from it. And then we come to the right time and scheduling to finish off. Uh, and I think there's some stuff linking back to the shrinkage. Contracted hours and available hours aren't necessarily the same. As we've seen in one of the graphs, customer behaviour probably means a lot of our schedules are obsolete. And if you have to produce your schedules four, six, eight weeks in advance, we're fighting a battle to adapt. Uh, and a lot of short notice changings. So flexibility, which embarrassingly is spelt wrong there at the bottom. Both of our staff and our attitude to our staff is now more important than it ever was. And I'm coming back to some of the things. If we ask, there are stuff out there uh, that people will do longer working days. People might want a longer lunch because they're feeding a family, or they might want a shorter lunch because if the weather is good, finishing early, and if your call patterns allow it, can give us to meet that spike and that demand. Split shifts help around the family. And also, we need to think about putting in those team meetings and training and finding the quiet times to do it. One interesting thing I heard again this morning was some centres are finding that people would actually prefer to work six days, but shorter, because from working in a social environment with dozens, if not hundreds of people around you, to working in a back room and seeing nobody for eight hours, it actually doing slightly shorter shifts and maybe doing an extra shift over the weekend is better for the mental well-being. But that might meet, and with the curl patterns I showed earlier, that would help me immensely if I thought I could get volunteers. So just to summarise, I know I've gone through a lot in a very short period, but I think the biggest one is we use this period as a time of learning. Let's see what we can learn about flexibility, about how quick we can adapt, how quick we can bring in new ideas and models, because something will come in the future, whether it's one year or 10, it's going to be there. Understand our shrinkage, understand what's new and how to track so we have valid figures for the future, the pre-COVID, the during COVID, and try to understand the post-COVID. Talk, talk, talk to our stakeholders, and it will help us with forecasting, particularly in a time where we've got great volatility by understanding what's going on. Remember that for many of us, homeworking is not homeworking. Uh, and therefore, our productivity, as we've seen in reality, is going to vary from company to company. So don't feel bad if you read some of the reports that says a homeworking solution will increase productivity by X percent. You're probably not in a homeworking solution at the moment. And then let's try new things. Let's talk to our staff and see what we can get but don't push them too hard because they're still adapting and we don't want to add that COVID shrinkage with extra sickness. So I will leave it there, John, uh, and hand back to yourself. Thank you very much indeed for that, John. We're going to go across to uh, do a quiz in just a minute. Uh, here's the uh, link here, callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat, and there'll be four buttons in the chat room. While you're logging into the chat room, if you're not already, and the short code is cch.chat, just a couple of points to thought from John's presentation that were great. Uh, the traffic profiles have changed, I think, you know, whether that's uh, during within the day uh, or per week. Uh, and I think that like, is one of the real serious takeaways there is to, is to don't just go for one number, plan for a variety of different situations. And uh, if you can get your management team bought into that, uh, because that, I think that's most likely to happen, happen and understand what the new uh, shrinkage is. Well, we've got 102 people logged into the chat room uh, already, so there's still time if you're one of the 80 who are not logged in. Um, so let's go and uh, start the uh, first question. And that is, what is the name of the rule that summarizes the impact that one absent advisor can have on contact center performance? Is it the potential of one? Is it the power of one? Is it the impact of the individual? Or is it the strength of self? And if you use little buttons in the uh, chat room, so is it A, the potential of one? B, the power of one? C, the impact of the individual? Or D, the strength of self? So I think we've got uh, 49 people have voted. I'll just give you a couple more seconds to vote on this. and. Uh, I think we've got most people there. And let's have a look. Well, most of you got that right. It is indeed called the power of one. We did a webinar on that. Gosh, I think there's a recording still online. We did that uh, about six years ago, I think. 
The power of one helps uh, convey to advisors how much uh, harder they have to work uh, and the impact on the business if just one advisor is absent. It's the balancing uh, demand and uh, uh, and expertise. It's a really great one to have a look at. Um, so how many types of Erlang formulas are there? Is it A1, is it B2, is it C3, or is it D4? How many types of Erlang formulas are there? That should be quite a straight one to, uh, quite a straight one to follow there. And uh, let's get most of you voting. Quite a straightforward one, this one that took, might take a little while to, to work it through. And uh, Yes, most of you have got it right. The uh, answer is C. Uh, there are actually three uh, Erlang formulas. Uh, Erlang B was the first, followed by Erlang C. Uh, Erlang A was an extension of uh, Erlang C that uh, uh, is Erlang A for abandons. You sometimes hear about uh, Erlang X, but as far as I can tell, that's just a sort of branded version of, uh, of Erlang, uh, Erlang A. So, um, Scores are changing there. So according to over 190,000 entries into our Erlang calculator, what is the industry standard figure for uh, target for occupancy that people put into the Erlang calculator? Is it A, 78%, B, 83%, C, 88%, or D, 93%? So which one do you think is the, uh, if you like, if, if, uh, as an industry average figure, for occupancy target that people uh, people use. And let's have a look at the uh, results. And again, most of you, uh, uh, or the largest number of people have got that, uh, got that right. Um, the, uh, uh, according to our um, Erlang calculator and looking at the statistics of those, 83% uh, is the average figure that people use. So it's a, a good sign that people are getting the, uh, getting the message not to uh, drive occupancy uh, occupancy above that 85% uh, 85 mark. And so the last question, who said, uh, this is our quote question, an unsophisticated forecaster uses statistics the same way a drunken man uses lampposts for support rather than for illumination? Was it A, Andrew Lang, B, Oscar Wilde, was it C, Albert Einstein, or was it uh, Nobel Prize winner Nils Bohr? Which one said, an unsophisticated forecaster uses statistics as a drunken man uses lamp posts. Uh, well, the answer to that one, oh, and most of you got that right, is Andrew Lang. So uh, well done to, to you on that. All of the others uh, had some quite interesting quotes on forecasts. So Oscar Wilde said, to expect the unexpected shows the thoroughly modern intellect. So I think, John, that would sum up your, uh, sum up your presentation almost, which is expect the unexpected. And build that into your forecast. As the Albert Einstein, the <laughs> indeed, Albert Einstein said, "I never think of the future; it comes soon enough." And uh, Niels Bohr said, "Prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future." So uh, I think that's a great little, uh, uh, great little, uh, great little piece there. So um, uh, let's go across to the uh, across the chat room and see um, what's uh, what's been uh, what's been happening in the in the chat room. And uh, the first thing is a uh, question from Carl. Do you anticipate that issues with shifts will increase with an increase in home working? Uh, also, when doing recruiting, home working may attract interest from a different demographic. I'll ping that across to, uh, uh, across to you, John. Do you anticipate uh, issues with shifts will ease? Uh. I think it definitely, if you take the second part and the demographics, it will bring people in who can't do certain shifts if the commute and the visit to an office is part of it. So depending on your opening hours, you may have transport issues and people will opt out of work with a certain company because they have no way of getting home. So it's a very practical of a yes. Uh, and also, I think I mentioned in my thing, if you do have a lengthy commute and you no longer have to do it, it probably makes you more tolerant of doing different range of shifts depending on your travel time. Uh, and in part B, absolutely, is people have opted out of the workplace for various reasons, from as basic as a disability through to childcare issues, parental uh, care, whatever that might be. Homeworking opens the door to people who will value and respect the job in a different way. 
Indeed, and Mike, this is an interesting uh, tip that's in from uh, Oliver. He said, with the virus moving to working from home, we stopped scheduling breaks and moved to flexible schedules where the agents choose when to go on lunch and when to take their breaks. It was a great boost engagement. Though it took a few weeks to settle in, we've seen engagement increase through regular communication that agents now naturally avoid the, the busy time. I guess if you're working from home, there's a, a, a sort of double flexibility there. Yeah, and um, I suppose like that notion, if you like, of empowering the agent with, with, with making that choice, um, kind of like, uh, uh, Deepens their investment, if you will, in the in, in, in the greater good. So that's that's it's it's it's, it's nice to see, and um, interesting. I mean, it's kind of a uh, human nature. It's that you have faith in human nature. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, I think it's um, sense trust, trusting your staff. I think it's yeah. an important yeah. uh, important one. Since October, John, I've been working in that environment. It took me about a fortnight to get my head around it. But actually, it doesn't cause us many problems, but people seem happier that they can be treated as an adult and maybe take six, five minute breaks if they smoke or three, 10 yep. minute breaks. It helps them get through the day. They don't go over their limits as a whole. Indeed. So uh, let's uh, have a, they've got a, a tip in from Daniel. Daniel says, uh, look for new trends and customer behavior caused by your customers now working from home. The norm is no longer the norm. Uh, we have a new normal that needs to be tracked, monitored, and uh, and learned from. So, a good chance uh, to jump across to uh, Daniel, um, and uh, sorry, to, uh, to jump across from Daniel to uh, Daniel stick to Mike. And uh, Mike, if you'd like to uh, share with us uh, your thoughts on uh, the secrets of workforce management, uh, while you're getting your slides up, just it uh, looks like I didn't announce the winner of the quiz. So uh, we will get the we'll get the uh, I haven't got that screen in front of me right now. We'll get the winner of the quiz and uh, we'll announce that uh, immediately after Mike's presentation. Mike, trust okay. you. Excellent. Okay, just uh, I was just going to point that out, John. So well, you you beat me to it. Well done. Um, so um, my my little section really is talking about technology and this and this wonderful subject. It's 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 a fascinating subject and um, it 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 just kind of. Um, it's 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 endless improvement, I suppose. Really, is what I what I observe. But I just I just love it, and um, I'm, I'm I'm delighted to be sort of part of it. Really, um, the, the the three things I kind of wanted to talk about really were, as we sort of move as a technology provider to um, writing new software and sort of modern software, or if you like, if we're if we're thinking about how we're coding software today versus how we used to do it before. It gives us a lot of different opportunities. So I kind of want to touch on some of those and just, just show you how, because we're doing things differently in the background, it just makes life a lot easier in the actual contact center itself. So that's the kind of first part of what I wanted to talk about. And um, the second thing is, again, if you like building on that, is that because we are doing it differently and we have like an access to like an abundance, if you like, of, of, of processing power in the cloud, um, that just lends us to getting away from some of the old rules that, if you like, the, the systems that we might be using today or have been using in the recent past have kind of forced us into. And um, it's not saying that those sort of methods and techniques were wrong, it's just that that's all we kind of had at the time. But obviously, these days it's very, very different. And, and with that comes opportunity. So I just wanted to kind of signpost to some of those things that I think are quite refreshing and quite revealing. And then the last point really was just more about, I suppose, um, as we're kind of developing software in a very modern way, and it's kind of come up twice in the in the webinar so far, it's the notion of being able to be agile, and uh, I think that's that's a really important sort of um, uh, word in the kind of uh, in the subject in the industry within software, uh, within the contact center, within customer care, really within customer experience, and uh, and no more so than right now. So let me kind of jump into those and, and, and see how we how we navigate. And um, I mentioned that you know we are, if you like, you know, working with tools now that are, you know, well, it's not the ought to be sort of, but mostly cloud-based tools. So everything I'm talking about today is assuming, if you will, like a, a cloud-based architecture. And, and just to be quite clear on that, I'm not talking about taking a platform I've been working with for 20 years and kind of moving it into the cloud and, and sort of like calling it like a cloud. I'm talking about, you know, an application which has been coded especially to work in the cloud. And that's in that sense, if you like, that that needs a different set of software. It has to be recoded. So the things I may have worked on and done 
10 years ago would be very different to the way I would do the same things now because I had to recode the application. And there's a, there's a bit of sort of caution to be sort of uh, highlighted there really, and that is to say that if you're not actually kind of working with a provider who is kind of taking those steps, then just, just be wary where that provider will be in the sort of longer term. And we're sort of seeing, you know, you know tech is always a fast moving sort of um, part of the, of the industry. But if you like, um, you know, we have seen organizations just sort of vanish on the back of not being adapting to what customers need. So by having sort of a cloud-based application, what it gives me is this notion, if you like, of unlimited processing power. And that's really what we're sort of driving behind some of the adv advantages. And because I have that sort of like processing power, sort of like on tap, um, like never ending, 24 hours a day, it's, it's, it's very refreshing. And if you can imagine the challenges of, of wrestling with the data around workforce management, it's, it's kind of like a beautiful scenario because I've got the, I've got the, the energy, I've, I've kind of got a, um, uh, an endless supply for like of that energy. I've got lots of data that kind of crunch. Um, one thing about artificial intelligence is it kind of needs clean data, and that's a real challenging thing if you like. If you're coming from a legacy environment, and obviously what I've described to you now is that things that are truly cloud-based are very clean, very modern, very uh, tidy if you like applications, and therefore they lend themselves beautifully to to AI. And, and some of the sort of like the outcomes that that, that brings, if you will, to a, a forecaster in, in their daily tasks would be helping to root out those kind of pieces of missing data or, you know, like gaps in the in the load information and th things where I would normally have to sort of manually sort of adjust to modify just to sort of like to, to, to give the full sort of picture and do some uh, little overrides perhaps. Um, another scenario might be the, the idea of the outliers, so like the, the unexpected um, email that comes from marketing, which sort of like suddenly develops a whole surge of traffic on the on the operations that we weren't expecting. Um, again, because I have this sort of like um, AI sort of powered capability in the background, I'm kind of watching for this kind of all the time, and I'm able to where where it's uh, within my sort of rules and within my guidance that I set. I'm able to make those manual overrides and adjustments so that I can accommodate and be more uh, accurate and realistic. Uh, I mentioned Agile already, so that, that's something which kind of resonates, I think, in this sort of like point where we have this sort of pattern detection. And, you know, the, the, the new norm, if you will, is yet to be defined because we're trying to understand the new patterns. And, you know, the, 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 the challenge of finding new patterns is catching the, catching the data and catching the patterns and then you're making sure and validating that they are the right sort of pattern. So, my point really is that with, with AI and that sort of like everlasting sort of um, uh, power and energy and, and, and forecasting resource, we're able to kind of spot that quicker, bring it to the right people's attention and kind of get active and get, get busy on it and, and bring value. And those, there's a, that pattern detection is particularly good for things detecting uh, things like seasonality, uh, which I think is what that graph is, is doing there. Particularly when you've got unusual seasons in your graph. We all know we have you know, hour, week, uh, month, year, but it's those unusual Saturns in sort of billing cycles and, and things like that that can, that can be very powerful. Indeed, and I think as well, like just as we kind of redefine them, you know, and, and, and learn what the new ones are, um, and, and absolutely, John, I think it, it just helps to kind of pull, pull that data to, to, to fact. The, the, the model selection is kind of you're building on something which John mentioned about running your multiple sort of forecasts and uh, being able to kind of play those different models, those are the different forecasting models. And, 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 and with that then allowing the kind of AI to sort of observe, you know, take the readings from each and then sort of make its recommendation, if you will, as what it believes to be the right forecast against which you should be you should be working. So so just, just some insights really to what um, if you like new can bring for all of us. And, and, and just to be clear, I'm talking about, you know, like, like freshly coded software here. So something that's been, if you like, uh, crafted within the last sort of four to five years. Um, I'm not talking about the sort of, you know, version 20 of an application that's been around for a long time or your know, version, you know, like Genesis workforce management was like version nine. You know, these things have been kind of out and about there for many, many years. Like, again, I'm not saying they're wrong. It's just that they were built for a time. And that time is very different to what we're, what we're using today. Obviously, the kind of again, the the benefits would be things like you know, thirty seconds to to run a plan like a schedule, um, where, where typically in the past that was like a you know a master button press and then kind of go home and come back and it's all there for you. So from those from that perspective, you know, those kind of refreshing help assistance, if you will, starts to come to the fore. Uh, I mentioned the multiple forecasting models, but it also it, it kind of brings you the accuracy that we we think we need. 
and um, from our perspective, that's obviously you know something that we're pretty 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 proud of. So I kind of wanted to sort of show you how it's sort of changing the game a little bit, and this is just sort of going into a little bit of our, if you will, like in design into like early sort of coding stage, um, and this 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 notion, if you like, of having a live and continuous forecast. Um, so, 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 so think of it as like the sort of 747 takes off, it's kind of in flight and it's making its way across the Atlantic, it's sort of adjusting to the weather and making those sort of changes, but it's kind of like an everlasting flight really. And, and that's the kind of notion that we're kind of building at the moment and, and that's, that's proving to be quite, quite interesting and there's some uh, interesting sort of ideas that that sort of generates and there's some consequences from that which are also quite interesting and some of those, if you will, will be the idea of, you know, automating the sort of time off management um, uh, challenges and, and the shift, the shift um, management challenges. So yes, there are tools out there today that make it helpful, more easy and more accessible with, with apps, etc. But just to actually kind of take care of all of that with with the uh, with software is, is pretty powerful and pretty helpful. So um, we are sort of staying here accepting collaboration partners and that's, that's true, that's real. Um, so we are open from our product management side and, and they were kind of keen to remind me to, uh, if you are an interested party, give us a nudge and we're happy to engage you with the conversation. But the last point I just wanted to make and, and really briefly, you know, that is, you know, this notion, if you like, of new software means that we do what's called continuous improvement. And what that means is that the software doesn't stop. Okay, so what you're looking at here is the called Genesis Cloud application. But if you will, as I add new functionality, I just do that every Wednesday morning. Okay, it's not a case where I stop the application every week and restart it. I don't. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of users on this um, application right now, and um, to that end, it's kind of designed to be a, a scalable application. Um, you know, think like global, think like Netflix, think like Amazon Prime. That that type of sort of reach and capability, and this is how this software is designed. So. As I bring in new functionality, it just appears in my subscription, and that's really, really cool. I don't pay the subscription, I don't get the feature. So think about it as, as, as we sort of talk about adding new capability quickly in an agile way, that's kind of how we bring it to life. And it really is a step change from what we've been used to working with in the past, shall we say. And like I said, I'm not saying the other platforms were wrong, it's just that I think, you know, time has moved on, and with new sort of energy and new capability, we can do things differently. So hopefully that's been helpful to the to the webinar. and. Um, I look forward to, uh, well, handing it back to you, Jonty. Pretty impressive uh, things there in terms of the uh, artificial intelligence coming through. Uh, if you'd like to see a demonstration of the uh, Genesis uh, Cloud uh, solution, uh, just pop that into the uh, into the desk there. I think certainly think the way that neural networks coming in for things like detecting outliers, pattern matching, uh, I think uh, is very powerful. So. Uh, That'd be quite interesting to see. Um, so we're going to jump across to the chat room now and have a look at some of the uh, some of the questions and the opinions that have uh, uh, been coming through. And um, the first one is that uh, Lani said uh, we're tracking metrics for work from office against work from home. What we've said the work from home guys are far outshining the guys at the office, which I think is a uh, is a is a very fascinating thing to see. Uh, Bupendra said, we've noticed that creating different chat groups for each department in Microsoft Teams has made the colleagues more enthusiastic while working as they're all able to keep in contact as they would in the office and have been able to uh, help each other with queries a lot quicker. So I guess that's a sort of like a, a chat room, I guess, like we've got running alongside here, uh, running yeah. alongside the uh, phone calls. Well, so, the, the, the virtual team working going nicely, which is really cool. I think that's that, that's helpful, I think. So here's a question in from Keith who says, uh, who's established rules for holiday accumulation and for any staff who are furloughed? Whilst not working, they're building up unused allocation, this building up a, a backlog of leave for when they do return. Are the rules the same for, as for maternity? John, there's um, certainly, uh, it's just not furloughed staff, but um, staff uh, in, at work can also be building up a lot of leave for later in the, later in the year. Oh, John's on mute. Sorry, just seen the flash up. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, there is a big risk if people don't take because they're not allowed to leave the house you're building it up. On the furlough, I'm honestly not 100% real, and I think that will be country by country, and probably government sites is going to be better uh, to make sure. But I know a lot of employment rights in certain countries do stay with you when you're furloughed. 
But I know in the UK there was something about encourage staff to take annual leave whilst they are furloughed. It sounds a bit weird when they're not there anyway. So it's probably got to do with burning some of your work at 100% salary that you would normally be paying versus the 80% government salary alongside it so that you don't accumulate it. But beyond that, can't really answer on a legal thing. <laughs> I think I think it's actually works. It's more expensive to have employees taking annual leave because I think you pay for the annual leave, whereas you, you don't pay, pay for the the furlough. Leave. So it is actually uh, it is is a sort of bit of a time bomb uh, time bomb that overall. Anyway, we've reached the top of the hour. Yeah. I'd just like to ask in, if you can put it into the chat room in one or two words. What did you like best about today's webinar? I have the winner of the of the of uh, from earlier. Which didn't present is Joseph Eight, who got uh, four out of four and was the quickest to uh, quickest to do those. So we'll be in touch with you about uh, a prize for that. And uh, if I can get the uh, winning tip up, the winning tip is from Tony One, who said that said availability will often change due to at-home responsibilities, regular check-ins with your team to query preferences and availability, especially those that are quieter, will ensure full engagement during these. Uh, these hours, I think it's a, it's a great tip. If you can fill in the survey when you leave, we'll have the replay on uh, in about an hour's time. I'd just like to say thank you to our two presenters. It's been an absolute blast, this one uh, uh, here in a very big audience. Thank you to John Casey from CC Planning. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Thanks for letting me be here. And uh, thanks again to uh, Mike Murphy. It's uh, great to see your insight there. Yeah, thanks, John. Thanks, John. Thanks, okay. everybody. Cheers. Thanks very much, Jeff, and we'll see everyone again next week, hopefully. Thanks, man. Uh, stay safe. Bye. -bye.